housing crisis is wreaking havoc nationally. Our podcast discusses how it is playing out specifically in Black Berkeley, California. Chronicling the lived experiences behind what people call gentrification. Detailing our endeavor for our right to stay and our right to return. Brought to you by Healthy Black Families. I am your host, Deb, and this is Telling Our Stories, The Housing Chronicles. Welcome. This episode is part two of our four-part conversation with incredible women playing critical roles at Healthy Black Families, Inc. Executive Director Wilhelmina Wilson, Deputy Executive Director Ayana Davis, and Board Chair Suzette Chomet. Let's dive right in. Let's talk about what are the causes of housing insecurity for Black Berkeley as y'all see it. Ayana, can you chime in on that? First of all, we are on our lonely land, and we have to acknowledge that we are on the land that was forcibly taken from the Ohlone people who dwelled here and were keepers of the land in this area and all the relations on this land for thousands of years. As a result of the colonization of this area and the historic systemic racist policies that have perpetuated redlining and economic oppression that has resulted in the displacement, historical unprecedented displacement of tens of thousands of black folks. But even prior to that, to colonize this area, the genocide of the Ohlone people is the foundation of the development of the Bay Area and California and of course, the United States. Having lived here in Berkeley as a mother and black birthing woman who has given birth to six babies and raised seven children and many community children, I have experienced and seen firsthand how institutionalized racism impacts families. And this history of this, especially the impacts on our access to land ownership, healthy housing and food, as well as educational and health outcomes. I saw with my own eyes the change in the black community through the economic devastation that occurred not only with the war on the black community that resulted in mass incarceration of young black men, but a war waged through chemical warfare with a targeted, our community here targeted with saturations of drugs, including crack cocaine, which resulted in the so-called crack epidemic. But there was also, along with that, increased militarization of the police and economic destabilization of our neighborhoods and displacement of black communities. In this, you know, as I've lived in Berkeley and observed, I have seen specifically in South and West Berkeley the change in the neighborhoods, the demographic makeup, also the cultural shift Housing insecurity has changed everything about South and West Berkeley. And that includes leadership, businesses, how we live. This unprecedented mass displacement of Black folks that has happened over the past 40 years in Berkeley and the preceding redlining and segregation, and that includes in the schools, in businesses, everything. Berkeley is one of the most segregated cities I've ever experienced. This history and this reality couldn't have happened without the collaboration of community politicians and leaders in this city. Not only the city, the county, the state, the region, and the national governing bodies and institutions. I also believe that the University of California has to have some accountability around the housing insecurity in Berkeley and land use in Berkeley. And finally, just speaking to the Adeline Corridor community, how housing insecurity has impacted. You can just literally ride around the city. They've tried to hide, and over the course of the past few years, there's been some Band-Aid implementation But there's a huge homeless population and unhoused community in Berkeley. And people are dying in these streets on the ground. And that's the biggest impact. People could be living that have died. 
the suffering, degradation, and inhumane conditions that occur through housing insecurity, people being unhoused, the gentrification and mass displacement has created harm that needs to be repaired, that needs to be stopped. Yeah. The history that you expound on, the local history of Berkeley, right from colonial underpinnings to the systems that undergird and hold in place those that allowed for that colonization to happen. And now here we are, you know, push forward several hundred years and nothing has changed. But I'm grateful for how you name through your history exactly how we got here. Mina, can you tell us how you see housing insecurity for Black Berkeley? I have to say that oftentimes we feel that things haven't changed, but actually a lot has changed. I don't think the dynamics, the underpinning dynamics have changed, but we've evolved through a lot of passages of this civil rights struggle. As I come to leadership at Healthy Black Families, I'm the youngest of five of my siblings. And really, I have no memory of living at 1433 Hearst Avenue. Um, I think my father was positioned in a way where he knew of the BART development. And so he had an opportunity to make a choice. So many in the community didn't have an opportunity to make a choice. Um, And that's been true across generations for Black people. So when we think about, and I think history is pertinent to this, so I'm just going to go back a ways. Um, When we think about property in the United States of America from our earliest birthings, the property that the white establishment was handling at that time weren't, you know, single family homes and duplexes and corporate dwellings. The property that they were steeped in that grew most of the wealth that allows them to orchestrate the current environment came from mortgaging human beings. And those were enslaved Black people. And that's where mortgaging in the United States really cut its teeth. They were mortgaging human bodies. And so we haven't really addressed that at a level that allows us to remedy that structurally. And so what I mean is things have changed and they haven't changed is, yes, we've evolved through millennia, you know, generations, decades of social structures, but What hasn't changed is that Black people have always been the most vulnerable. They've always been the most exploited. And they always have been the ones who were not allowed because of policy legislation, laws, social mores, terrorism and tyranny in white communities that allowed things like Tulsa, Oklahoma and devastation at Allensworth right here in California and Visalia, you know, the first Black town in California. They suffered. Their leader died in Sacramento mysteriously when he went to advocate for them for their rights to own property. So it it, it goes really far back. So uh, I don't think there's health for Black families without the opportunity to invest themselves in real estate, home ownership in this land. And so that's what Equity for Black Berkeley is all about. So in the historical era that I'm really looking at, which is when my life comes into being, My parents moved to Berkeley. My father did the GI Bill. He didn't get to buy property, but they did eke out a college education for him. But even in that, Black men who came out of World War II didn't get those same opportunities the way white men did. And they had families too. When my father went to Columbia University out of the war, he and his friend, who ended up being the dean of the Howard University Law School, had to decide who would go first because they only allowed one Black to matriculate each year. And they decided because my mother was pregnant with my oldest sister that they would allow my dad to go first. And he followed the following year. But as a young attorney, he was hired. They, again, living their values by Governor Pat Brown to write the Fair Employment Practices Law for the state of California. And so this is a hotbed of time in Berkeley. At the same time, Byron Rumford is working for fair housing at the state level. And although progress was made, The willingness of the power structure never fully embraced the spirit of the statutes. It was that unwillingness of spirit to uphold the statutes 
that continues to perpetuate social inequity. And I don't think it's very different now than it was before. And so Equity for Black Berkeley is an opportunity to raise the consciousness of Berkeley around these historical inequities that have really laid the foundation for gentrification. The barring of Black people from gathering and accumulating wealth, intergenerational wealth over those decades is what primes their communities to be gentrified. They don't have the roots in the ground to sustain their foothold that all of those who have exploited them do. So, like I said, my father made a choice. He moved to El Cerrito. He took his equity and left. And after the BART system was put into place, they stopped right one block from where their house was. But they had no way of knowing that at the time. So at that time, Jesse Unruh was working in civil rights here in Berkeley. Byron Wentford, as I said, was appointed by Mayor Lawrence Cross to the Emergency Housing Commission, which sought to find housing for wartime laborers. In his capacity as a member, he was able to push for more integrated housing. He helped organize Berkeley's Interracial Committee, a citizens committee whose purpose was to placate and to welcome some of the people, to ameliorate some of the problems, did arise as a result of an influx of Southerners, Black people, to Berkeley. The Berkeley Interracial Committee welcomed the Southerners to the community and helped them to reign all of those problems, helped them to orient and integrate into the community. It worked with the committee on fair play rights. They helped try to fight the Japanese internment that took property from Japanese folks in Berkeley, and they established a Human Relations Commission. Um, in 1944, Governor Earl Warren appointed Byron Rumford to the Rent Control Board, a state agency that played a part in the federal wartime program to keep rents and wages high and rents down. Does this sound familiar? We, we've been doing the same thing for a long time. Other people in the area, in that era, were Eileen Hernandez. She was a powerful Black woman who was working for Flair Employment Practices. She actually started the Equal Opportunity Commission under President Lyndon B. Johnson in 1964. And after only 18 months, she resigned because of the same unwillingness. She was frustrated by the commission's lack of speed in addressing any of these discrimination cases. So what we're really dealing with is not a lack of effort that's been put into a push for housing, but a lack of spirit of collaboration and support. We haven't moved from that basis of exploiting people for capitalism versus creating space for everyone to be able to live here in this nation and thrive and, you know, accumulate wealth and do everything that Americans have been promised to be able to do. So that's my take on why housing insecurity exists in Berkeley. It's why housing insecurity exists in California. It's why housing security insecurity exists in our nation, and it's a global problem. So if we look at it as a kind of sociological challenge, how do we as people create the space for all of us to have what people need to survive, thrive, and live in this world? That is the question. And I agree, Mina. It's there's always a lag, right? Our We've always worked, been in movements to be seen as whole human beings and laws get instituted, but institutions are held by humans and humans are humans. They carry with them what they carry with them. So that lag is real. The other thing when I think about that, Deb, is we all we talk often about systems and large system change. Um, System is a way to separate it. It makes it very impersonal. And so when I think about changing large systems, it's like, yeah, those systems need to change. Education, healthcare, law, law enforcement, you know, it just goes on and on. Employment development, employment opportunities, all of the things that are the legs on the stool that hold up. But then I think like, what's the most granular piece of any system? The most granular piece of any system is you and me. Mm -hmm. And if we can't challenge ourselves to show up at the table of that system every day, in a way that's inclusive and thinks of other than self as a priority, then there's no hope for the larger system. It starts with us. So all these policymakers who are sitting, you know, one of the things that has really, we talk about housing, 
Ayana and I have been on a thread for an unhoused community member, Berkeley man, for since the week before Christmas. And there are all of these, you know, just dynamics that go on. I see the city council sending out notices about all this bad weather. Buy sandbags for your homes. If you need resources to secure your property, this is where you go. But not, in none of these have I seen anything about the unhoused, who are the most vulnerable in our community. And we've been following this gentleman's journey for over six weeks now. And it's a comedy of errors that's absolutely not funny. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to make sure that that man doesn't die this winter on the streets of Berkeley. And it takes how many of you? Uh, definitely two warrior women. Well, it's a group of like 10 people. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Yeah. Of common Berkeley citizens, they're making food to take to the shelter because they have shelter but no food for people. And people get hungry every day. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, you know, so you think about the breadth of humanity and not just our interests. There's a lot more that we're in service of. And I think this is an opportunity, again, sociologically, to expand our perception of what humanity means and what our opportunity in service of that is. Yeah. Thank you, Mina. Suzette, what do you think are the causes of housing insecurity for Black Berkeley? Something that I often look at is food insecurity. So did you know that in the city of Richmond, there is not one full service grocery store in the entire city? There's small mom and pop produce spots. There are convenience stores. There are liquor stores. But a full service grocery store does not exist within the entire city of Richmond. How does that happen? That's not by accident. And, you know, if we want to look very specifically at the definition of food apartheid, food apartheid is a system of segregation that divides those who have access to an abundance of nutritious food. These are rules that are put in place that keep people away from food. These are governing bodies that are making decisions about where food stores will be. Not too long ago, I saw a gentleman on the street who was unhoused and he had six brand new bags of groceries next to him. And I thought to myself, well, someone is quite generous to have given him that food, but where is he going to store it? He does not have a refrigerator or cabinets. He's not likely to carry around those six bags all day either, because who wants to carry around six bags of groceries all day? And so housing and food apartheid are both linked to one another, and they are created by policies and people making those policies. And we have to examine that and be critical of how these rules are made. Right, and fight them. And fight them, right. One of the references that I have been learning a lot from is The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. and. I think that one of the most important things for us to state clearly is that we can all agree that racism and prejudice didn't just come out of thin air. And as I think about this in the context of housing, I think one of the most or one of the greatest travesties and tragedies is that there is more money spent on maintaining homelessness than there is in solving the problem. When you think about all of the staff people that work at soup kitchens and social services and the shelters and all of the different ways that are built to support people who are unhoused, it would cost far less for us to build housing and to get all of those people housed. And so we really need to examine that as a real issue. But the attitudes that support housing discrimination in Berkeley and throughout our nation are rooted in the system of enslavement upon which the United States of America was founded and the genocide of indigenous people that preceded it. You know, I'm often on next door, this place where people talk all about what's going on in their neighborhoods. And I see complaint after complaint about how unfamiliar people are trespassing on their property or stealing their things. And I can't help but think about the indigenous people who lived here before. 
and having white people steal their land, kill and rape their people, and then create national parks to keep them out from living in places that they had lived before. And if you don't know the history of national parks, you should really look it up. But the intention was to keep people from being in the parks from sundown to sunup. How can you live someplace that you can't even go in to sleep? So that's something that happens in the United States is that we have these false pretenses for, you know, the enjoyment of the public, but we don't think about what preceded that. But I I digress. But these rules are made by people who sit around tables. They discuss them. They create policies. They're just people, commissions, and government officials who are doing this. And so we need to examine all of this and really call out the systems and policies that do not work because they were not made by accident. They don't happen by accident. And these are often strategic decisions that are made. So we, again, have to be willing to take a look at and scrutinize the policies that create this housing crisis. And that does not meet our most vulnerable people's needs. When we have solutions, we have to look at who benefits from keeping people unhoused and who is really harmed in the process. And that's real. And so I really do think that housing insecurity, it's produced, it's created, it's manufactured by people. And therefore, other people can change these rules and policies. And it's up to us to do that. And that's why Equity for Black Berkeley is such an important initiative. Yeah. The fact that it costs more to keep things the way they are than to actually propel people into a better place is perhaps a glimpse into how much it takes to keep what people call white superiority into place, right? Why is it important to keep things the way that they are? I mean, that's a question. As as we discuss, it's all systems and the systems are at the minute level housed by us. How do we change that? This has been part two of a four-part conversation with Wilhelmina Wilson, Ayana Davis, and Suzette Chomet. Stay tuned for part three, where we discuss the various ways Healthy Black Families, Inc. is organizing to mobilize its community. Written, edited, and hosted by Deborah Hailu, Telling Our Stories program coordinator at Healthy Black Families, Inc. Audio engineered by Adrian Davis and Salim Naji Ula of One Hitter Entertainment. Shout out to James Shields of Creative Shields for our beautiful podcast artwork. Akila Shahid, Office and Media Manager at Healthy Black Families, Inc. for the many ways she steps up and bridges our gaps. And Wilhelmina Wilson, Executive Director at Healthy Black Families, Inc. for bringing all of this together. Casting out the net of Black love in service of all humanity, this has been Telling Our Stories, The Housing Chronicles. See you next time.